We are excited and thrilled to be back with another installment of one of, I know, your most favorite podcast, The Big Bid Theory. I'm your host, Bill Colhane, from what what is a scorching hot Austin, Texas. And by the way, we've heard all of the jokes. We've heard, is it a dry heat? Do we go to the sun to cool down? Is it hotter in Austin than a jalapeno's armpit? <laughs> and on and on. It, um, it's been above 100 for quite some time now. But anyway, Rick, Rick Jennings, our producer, is sitting in his, I should clarify, air-conditioned booth. Rick, breaking news, my friend. It's hot outside. I'm sorry. I can't hear you over the fan of the air conditioning that's going on here. Let me turn this off. There we go. A <laughs> uh, little audio design humor. Uh, yes, it is very hot here in Austin this week and probably will be for a bit. Speaking of hot, here's a hot topic. Yes, cannabis is still an illegal substance, according to the feds, federal law. However, speaking of news flashes, there are now 18 states, I think I counted correctly, and also Washington, D.C., which have laws in place that permit the possession, growing, and use of marijuana for adults. And also 39 states here in the U.S. have approved legalized medical marijuana programs. Well, in this episode, we have an expert. Nina French from Hound Labs will be dropping by the show, and she's going to discuss how this all impacts employers. And, and yeah, you listening out there, it applies to you as well. So, so listeners out there, what do your drug testing policies look like? How does it impact your conditions of employment, onboarding processes, ongoing staffing? Have you had a, have you had a conversation about it? Rick, turn your mic on again. Okay. Rick, and most of you know, in, in his day job, Rick sees a lot of bids and RFPs that come across his radar. Every single day, Rick is speaking with businesses out there. Rick, I assume you see many requests, bids, RFPs for employee screening services and the like. That's right. So, I mean, with with the increasing amount of states that are um, opting into cannabis uh, medical programs and such, I mean, it's we're putting some separation between that and, of course, there's lots and lots of uh, substances that people uh, test for in uh, pre-screening. Some of them get mentioned by name, some of them don't. But, um, yeah, with all of that, it's going to be really interesting to see um, where this specific industry kind of goes in um, terms of pre-employment screenings and such, now that laws are getting more complicated, and I'm sure we're going to hear more about that today. All right, Rick, before I let you go, keep your mic on it again. What's okay. ahead in crazy bids for this episode? Uh, yeah, for crazy bids. So, yeah, we were, um, yeah, speaking of cannabis, I mean, there's uh, still that lots that's going on in the field of illicit substances. And uh, uh, the one we're going to talk about today is a little bit more of uh, tackling some of those large issues from a university standpoint. So stay tuned. Well, there he does it again, Rick. That is a tremendous tease. Later in the show, another crazy bids you will not soon forget. Thanks to Rick. Let's get going. Our guest is standing by. So real quick, if you missed our first episode of season eight, you already know you can head over to YouTube and watch our interviews with our special guest. Yes, you heard me correctly. And by the way, again, no comments permitted regarding my lack of handsomeness here by your humble, humble host. So uh, save the typing. After this brief message, we'll introduce you to Nina French and learn more about the marijuana legalization debate, testing, employee screening, all that and more. The Big Bid Theory is brought to you in part by Bid Prime. Over 11 years in changing the bid services industry, Bid Prime has become the solution for businesses serious about winning public sector business. From the premier technology in the industry to real-time bid notifications, supporting documents, and robust data tools, it's all backed by unmatched, personalized customer support. Bid Prime. Start your free zero-obligation trial today. Bidprime.com. Nina French is president of Employer and Law Enforcement Solutions for Hound Labs. She's known across many circles, known across the country as really an experienced leader in the screening industry, 30 plus years, in fact. And she's done it all. Drug testing program design, policies and technologies is a sought after speaker at conferences. Along with being involved with one of the leading drug testing service providers, she co-founded her own consulting firm. A speaker, blogger, and writer on many screening industry topics. Today, she sits in our experts chair 
Here's Nina French. As I just mentioned over on the audio version of the show, now we're very happy to be joined by Nina French. And I want to get this right, just shared her bio. She's president of the Employer and Law Enforcement Solutions at Hound Labs. And she joins us here on the Big Bit Theory Hotline. Nina, thanks so much for returning to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, so let's get right to the heart of the matter. And I pulled up some numbers here. One of our researchers found this. So cannabis is legal in 39 states for medical use and 18 states and the District of Columbia for recreational use. How have new laws surrounding legalization of marijuana, how has that impacted all of those employers out there? Well, so I think we're actually up to 19 in the district as of today. Uh, which is actually a great place to start because that is the issue, right? Laws are changing very, very rapidly. Um, adult use continues to expand. Uh, we continue to see a lot of the same trends where first states legalize for recreation, or I'm sorry, for medicinal use. And then they quick, rather quickly, um, slowed slightly by the pandemic, but rather quickly into recreational or adult use. Uh, the challenge is that these are really largely unscripted. And so now what we're seeing are trends where the states that are coming to legalization now are looking at the laws in the states and learning two things, right? They're saying, okay, how was this successful as you implemented it in your state? And then how was it not quite so successful? And one of those things that they're trying to remedy is, how do you identify impairment, right? So with laws, they're, for, for cannabis legalization, they're seeing an enormous uptick in use in those states. They're seeing it on the roadside, they're seeing it at workplaces. And so now they're saying, well, how do we introduce laws just like you that had successes, but then how do we manage it for safety, safety, all these different places? The challenge is that word impairment. So we're seeing many of the states struggle with the introduction of the word impairment and trying to find an impairment standard. And an impairment standard for cannabis simply does not exist. There are a couple laws where they have introduced a number but the number is not based on anything. There's no science behind the number. Um, and that's really the challenge. We're seeing those laws sort of expand and duplicate themselves when actually they're not correct. So we don't want to clone them. They're going to cause trouble for employers and they're going to cause trouble for safety. Interesting indeed. And you and I, when we had a kind of a pre-production meeting, you and I talked about it. When you and I visited back in 2018, you know, the conversation was very similar. And something else that hasn't changed is I feel like there are still people out there who might be of the opinion of why spend all this money? Why spend all this time and effort in testing? If I'm a business owner, what are the benefits of having a pre-employment screening or testing of current employees? I know some of them seem obvious, but Nina, could could you kind of detail some of them? Right, I, I'm happy to, and I actually that's the foundational issue here, right? And 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 I think people sort of do workplace drug testing because that's what you do, right? That's what we do. We do that in the United States. And so really what these laws and the opioid epidemic and cannabis legalization are forcing employers to look at is, well, why? And this ties back then to that notion of impairment. So are we trying to prove whether or not our candidate or our employees are impaired? And the answer is no. That is not why you drug test in the workplace. You drug test in the workplace because it is a proven risk mitigation tool. It's been proven that it works. And so much like a wearable technology, right? A, a watch that you wear that tracks how many steps you take, right? What's your blood pressure? What is your heart rate? That in and of itself doesn't guarantee you that you won't have a heart attack 
or that you won't have high cholesterol. But what it does is it provides you with a leading measure that says, if I do all of these things, then when I get my physical, I believe I will be in better health. And drug testing is much the same. It's a risk mitigation and deterrence tool. So what the purpose of it is, is to deter use. And we've seen that use be successful. So when you looked at Quest Diagnostics, they have they published something called the Drug um, Testing Index, and they've published it forever. And when you saw it in the beginning, in the early, uh, I guess, 86, it was around a 13.1% or 13.6% overall workplace positivity rate, right? So that means of the people that they chose to test, 13.6% of them were positive for some drug that they tested for. And keep in mind, not all drugs are tested, right? But some drugs. So then we saw at the height of the opioid ep epidemic with cannabis legalization starting to spike, a low in like 2012 of like 3.1%. And that stood steady for a couple of years. So what does that tell you? That tells you, well, we know opioids were raging. We know that cannabis use was up, but yet we saw this extraordinary low in drug testing because drug testing deters use. It doesn't fix use, but it says, if you are choosing to work, we want to maintain a safe workplace. We want to maintain a productive workplace, right? It's not just for safety sensitive. We do not want people who are touching our PII, who have access to your credit card, who are customer facing. We don't want anyone who is associated with our brand using drugs while at work. And so the programs are set up not to be indicators of impairment, and in fact, cannot be indicators of impairment. That's a, another piece of this, right? But what they do is they deter use, and those are the leading indicators that employers can then see drop their workers' comp claims, right? They, they, they increase productivity. They drop absenteeism. All of those problems that are associated with use in the workplace are really like that scale at the end, right? That's your physical. You see that, and that's really the benefit of it. Yeah, no doubt. And and as I, I hear you speak there, Nina, and again, for our longtime listeners, they may recall when you stopped by the show, I think 2018 was your most recent visit. And back then, we discussed the opioid crisis. And here we are four or five years later. I think I mentioned to you the other day, I came across, and they're out there, but I came across a report saying how the opioid crisis is ongoing here in the country. So uh, the problem is there, whether people want to acknowledge it or not. Again, we're not a political show. There are other podcasts who uh, you know, politicize everything. But this is kind of a segue into what you folks are doing there at Hound Labs. But there are a variety of tests out there. Everybody knows them, the urine, the blood sample, the hair, the saliva, well, what are the limitations of those tests in summary? I know there's a list you could probably go through, but what are some of the more significant limit limitations? Well, I, th I think when it relates to cannabis, the biggest, most significant thing is that as all these laws were being passed and, work, and, and adult use and recreational, or we call it adult use or recreational use, but adult use started to come to ahead and, and started to be legal in the majority of states, right? It's available for over 180 million people in the United States. So there's a lot of availability, a lot of use. It's a growing industry. So what they didn't realize was that, that now you don't use blood in workplace. You can use that for roadside, but you can't really use that in workplace. So you look at hair. Hair simply just doesn't get in your hair anytime soon, right? It's, it's a lifestyle measure. It looks back, but but it doesn't get into your hair shaft, any drug, for a period of days, up to a week or so, right? So then you look at the two that are the most common, especially for federal workers, that's urine, and then they're looking to add oral fluids. Um, urine testing is a fantastic indicator of recent use. The problem is, no matter how you adjust that level, well, whether it be 15 nanograms that you're testing to or three, that is not an indicator of recent use. And that is the challenge, right? Because there will not be a work 
workplace impairment standard or likely a roadside impairment standard that is based on the millions of data points that it took us to get to an impairment standard for alcohol. We need to look at a time-based measure. And although urine can pick up, and so can oral fluid, pick up these drugs very quickly, they have this long tail. So if you look at the most recent notice of proposed rulemaking from uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, they indicate that cannabis can be found in urine for up to 67 days. It can be found in oral fluid for, depending on where you look, 24, 36, 48 hours. And so when you're looking at a legal use state, how are you going to be fair to those employees, right? When you say we want to test, this is a proven risk mitigation tool. This is going to save our company money. This is going to increase the value of our products and services. But yet, we can't differentiate between if this person is using at work or if they did an edible legally over the weekend at a party, right? And so that's the challenge using the methods that have been available to date, your challenge is either I have no way to prove recent use. And so I, some employers, not a large percentage, but some employers are looking to drop it. Well, yeah, that, you know what the outcome is going to be, right? The outcome of that means everyone Mm -hmm. who uses is going to use at your workplace. Um, You are not solving the problem. You're ignoring the problem. If you looked at, How do you apply this? This is really the story of of how I came to Hound. Um, It is a great great segue. Yeah, that's a great segue, Nina. So on that note, how is Hound Labs trying to help contribute to try to solve the problem? Well, I mean, that's it, right? So so the, Mike Lynn, who's, who's the founder, and, and Jenny Lynn, who's the co-founder of Hound Labs, really set out with, I think, what they thought would be a, sort of a, an easy, wasn't easy, not easy, right? How do you do it? Well, can, can you catch, can you c- get a sample that proves impairment? Well, go back to that. We, we don't know what impairment is, right? Bodies, no matter how good your technology is, The challenge is that human bodies work differently. And again, workplace drug testing has never been about impairment, right? We set a limit. It is a policy. We enforce that policy. If you test at or above this limit, you are not allowed to come to work here, or we will take a negative employment action against you. So lots of people are getting caught up in that. So what Hatton Labs did was say, well, how can we just get that recent use? And it turns out that you can do that in breath. So in breath, you can find just a limited number of hours past use, right? And that's what's important. When a company is looking to implement, to continue to test, but implement a fair policy that restricts use either immediately before or during work, they can implement a breath test. And what the breath test doesn't say is whether you are impaired or not, right? Because we don't know what that is. And we don't want to go there because if you go there, by the way, then you start to have trouble with all the other drugs like opioids, amphetamines, all of the different drugs. Because again, it's not what we do. Pre-employment testing is not about are you impaired when you're coming to apply for the job, right? It is, this is a policy standard that we have in place and that we adhere to in our organization. And that's really what you're looking to do with breath. You're saying you may not use for a period of hours and define that in your policy prior to coming to work. And you also throughout your employment may not use while you are at work. And we will continue to monitor that. So it sort of is that really fair standard of trust, but verify, right? And so it allows employers to maintain that risk mitigation tool, but it does not, it, it is not a negative impact for employer, employees who can legally use, but are using outside of work. Very good. Well, Well, Nina, thanks so much uh, again for contributing to this episode. Want to remind our viewers slash listeners that there is actually a link to Hound Labs that will be in the description of the episode. And also, even though I covered Nina's bio, there will also be a link to, to Nina's bio there as well. So on behalf of everybody here at the Big Bit Theory, Nina, 
and our audience again thanks so much for taking time to to share information on what is such a, an important and ongoing story here in the United States and elsewhere thank you very much for having me i just said it for more on nina or hound labs go to the episode's description so many thanks to nina for sharing time on her very busy schedule rick you're busy get busy with this episodes crazy bids you can win i'd be glad to well first thanks to miss nina french giving us a lot of info um just over where cannabis is going what we're going to cover today in uh today's crazy bid um is going to be something that's um it's it's over an illicit substance it's a little bit more cut and clear over here so the title of this uh particular opportunity is titled methamphetamine prevention grant and this is put out by the university of Arkansas at Little Rock, specifically their Mid-South program. So the Mid-South Center for Prevention and Training, which is uh, basically a part of the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, is uh, basically a research group. And as we know, um, universities in the USA are kind of the bedrock of um, ongoing research in uh, practicing. And um, yeah, this one's definitely no different. So they won a substance abuse block grant that was uh, awarded to the state of Arkansas, and um, it basically tasks ev um, ev everyone that can um, with uh, uh, basically formulating prevention activities and research, and that's uh, basically what's being tackled uh, here at the Mid South Center. And this is coming from their um, the Arkansas the sorry the Arkansas Strategic Prevention Plan, which is their strategic five year plan in regards to substance abuse for promotion, prevention, and protection, um, which is just them taking a lot of different steps um, in order to in order to like cut back on this as much as they can. Which, um, as I as I read, apparently methamphetamine abuse is um, probably the number one illicit substance that has the most trouble um, there in Arkansas and neighboring southern states um, so it was really neat to see the mid-south center kind of hop onto this and uh, even look for some help um, from uh, vendors to see how they can implement this plan of theirs so if that's something that's within your scope of services um, that is most likely this episode's crazy bid that you can win yeah so how how relevant was that crazy bids to to this episode huh if you or someone you know or love or are fighting the battle We've included a link to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. That's in the description of this episode, and all the best to you. That was certainly an action-packed episode. Thank you for tuning in, sharing, downloading, and following The Big Bit Theory. We very much appreciate the emails. We try to answer all of them, by the way, get to as many of them as we can. If you have a special guest suggestion or idea for a topic or just want to send us a hello, you can email me at bcallhain at bidprime.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at The Big Bid Theory. My personal Twitter, as many of you know, is contract underscore hunter. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. We're all over the place. Powered by Bid Prime. Thanks again to Nina French from Hound Labs. Don't we need to get to work and get this right? There's been a lot of talk about this topic for a long time. I think it's time for a lot of folks to maybe roll up their sleeves a little higher. For Rick Jennings and our team of all-stars, this is Bill Colhane. Until next time, go Gunners, Barracudas, Tigers, Bobcats, and Cubs, and we wish you all the best in growing your business. Powered by Bid Prime, we thank you for tuning in to The Big Bid Theory. From Austin, Texas, the show is produced by Bill Colhane and Jim Ward. Producer and engineer is Rick Jennings. Distribution, research, and production assistance by Kevin Henderson. You can find other episodes of the show on platforms such as iHeart, iTunes, Spreaker, Google Play, Stitcher, and among others. As always, thank you for downloading and sharing the podcast. We're having so much fun, so much fun.